Andre interview. Take one. Okay, we are doing a free wild world interview. And uh, today's topic is uh, wine, poetry, and mental health. And I'm sitting here just outside of Tolbach on a beautiful wine estate, Lemberg. Lemberg makes amazing wine, one of my favorites. And uh, we're talking to Andre, she's the winemaker. And we're just going to talk about, uh, first of all, tell me a bit, how did you get to this place? Why this wine estate making wine? Where did it start? My passion for the wine industry, or this one specifically. Well, let's start with, let's start right from the beginning. Uh, where did you grow up? And how did you grow up? And why did you start making wine? What drew you to the industry? Was it always, where did it start? Where did you study? And then eventually, how did you get to Limba? And so, I was born here in Tolba. Um, my mother was a teacher and my dad was the magistrate, so getting to be a winemaker from that background doesn't quite make sense. Um, we moved away to Springbok and my dad got placed there and then um, after my parents divorced, me and my mom moved to Strand. Um, I was in school there, I wanted to study medicine, but I wasn't accepted into the program. And then um, I studied normal BC human life sciences for the first year with the idea to reapply for medicine the next year. But then halfway through the first semester, I saw that, hey, you can study winemaking. I never knew you could do that. I wasn't exposed to it in my life. Um, and yeah, because I'm a creative person as well, I thought, well, you know, I could now use science to be creative. And then I switched courses, studied winemaking and never looked back. I did my internship then at um, Bellingham, DGB in Wellington. They allowed me to do my master's degree, which I then also did. Um, after that, I went to Robertson for a few years, and then I came to work here in the year 2018. I was here for a year and a half, then went to Stellenbosch. Um, then the company where I worked there came COVID and they retrenched almost half of us and then I came back here and now I am making wine at Lindbergh for two years now again. Okay, tell me about this one. What, what is this? The one that I gave you there is the Pinot Noir. Um, it's quite unusual to be drinking this in Tolbach because Pinot Noir is normally known as a cooler climate cultivar, so mostly people grow it in the Emil and Arder Valley or in Algen. Um, we are one of the only farms here in the Torba region who has it, if not the only farm, um, except maybe for Karenu who might use it for um, MCC, but making full body red wines, we are the only ones. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite unusual to have it here, but um, it does do really well and it's one of our um, favourites. So Pinot Noir, explain the grape, is it more a lighter variety or lighter, easy drinking? Mm, yeah, so it's a Bordeaux variety, or not Bordeaux variety, but it's from France, um, from the Champagne region, and um, where it is cooler, and because it's lighter in South Africa, it's mostly used for MCC production, or um, from the cooler climates, people make red wines from it. Well, I also want to just apologize if you don't have, a, I don't have my proper sound equipment here, so I'm going to do my best in post with the sound, but if it's a bit but easy, just to give us. So I'm going to take a wild stab at this, mm. and uh, probably make a total ass out of myself. But I'm just going to um, guess. There's a bit of a, a, a little bit of. I get a little bit of a sour. There's almost like a sour gum thing. I don't know. Probably my imagination. And a plum, plumish, plum type of vibe. But definitely more like a citrus fruit, plummy. Thing. And a little bit of the yeah, hint of chocolate, so how wrong am I? Mm, you're not wrong at all. I also in this one get that sort of earthiness, like mushroom kind of vibe, leaves that has been mulching. I get mm. that that vibe also. Do you also get a bit of a plummy thing? Or? Yes, that's, that's more... quite common for it to have. Cool, and it's nice. Okay, so uh, tell me about, I want to know the wine, the wine making thing. Like you say, you're also an artist. As I think actually can we start with you reading one of your poems or one of your, one of your books you are published in books with other mm. people while I explain a lot of a few other things oh, yeah, I've got so much more other poems here that 
think it would be great to <laughs> Okay. And uh, then uh, first, uh, tell me about this poem, where it came from and what it's about to explain it. Okay, so this specific poem's name is Handmaid's Tale. Um, the poem is about me drinking wine with Jesus. Um, so I have this friend Ian and he listens to this song, I got so high that I saw Jesus quite often. Um, and that got me wondering, you know, what it would be like to drink wine with Jesus and also the wine that he made, how would it have tasted? Um, so that's why I would really love to actually be able to drink wine <laughs> with Jesus. But yeah, the, the specifics of this poem was when they um, overturned the um, constitution, the, the law in America, the Wade versus Roe, I think, to, for people's right to have an abortion. So this is what um, inspired this poem now being called Handmaid's Style. Thank you very much. Okay. Wits and bar is I sit with my foot there. Okay, yes. Okay, we were sitting here chatting and we had what they call it South African load shedding. I'm sure most people have heard about this before. Every now and then we just go in the dark. So we continuing our, uh, our thing and what are we doing here? You are pouring us some wine because Eskom is driving us to wine which is probably not a bad thing. No. Okay, we were at the poem that you read but uh, it was an Afrikaans and I'm too lazy to subtitle so we're gonna do another poem and then you're just gonna go line by line translate it as best as you can if you don't mind. Okay. So this... I'm going to get the poem to see on the side here quickly. The poem that I'm going to be doing, it's, it's actually a, a parody, a ironic poem, um, inspired by mental health. It's um, made, um, written on the rhythm of the um, Heavenly Father, the Daily Prayer. So, I'm just going to read it in Afrikaans first and then I'll just, just go, for it, go yeah. over it. So, the title is Onse Psychiater. So, I'm going to tell you that Onse Pille, what on the voorskrif is, Laat die doses vol die nie wees. Laat die neve effecte kom. Laat die chemie geskiet. So is in die lab, net so in die lewe. Gee ons vandag ons dagelijks stabiliteit en vergeef ons ons manische episodes soos ons ook die depressie vergewe, en laai ons nie in die versoeking nie, maar vergewe ons van die angst, want dan bieg forma behoor die koninkrijk, en die kracht, en die heerlijke, tot in eeuwigheid. Amen. So, um, if you have to translate it, um, if we translate to our, our psychiatrist, referring to our heavenly father, so you must pray. Our pills that are on the um, prescription. May the um, days be enough um, and let the side effects come, but let the chemistry do its work. Just in the lab, so in your liver, but give us today our daily stability and forgive us our manic episodes as we give the depression. And do not lead us into temptation, but forgive us um, our anxiety because on big, too big for mom, um, <laughs> too big for mom belongs um, the heavens and uh, the power and everything to eternity. Amen. <laughs> okay, we'll get to that part down. We have to remember this the forgiveness part of this is very important. And the chemical part. Okay, so we'll get back to the mental health thing because this is a very important part of this uh, interview we're having. It's more of a discussion. But just to point myself a bit, um, this following few months, I want to concentrate a lot more building this channel again with podcasts, with interviews like this, and with vlogs. So I have a couple of projects coming up. I deleted most of my videos like quite a while ago, and I was so disgusted that I didn't put a lot of effort in this channel. So I'm going to rebuild it now. I'm over the shock of deleting 200 videos way back. So, uh, and I, I was thinking of this, the mental health theme is a, is a good theme to keep in interviews and podcasts because we, a lot of people are struggling with that and we're living in an age where we can be open about it. It's okay now. They don't used to be open. Uh, in the old days, they kept the mad people outside of town. 
in the in the vineyards. They were not allowed to come into town, but now we know we're all mad, so it's cool. So, but uh, we're going to go back to the wine first, and I want to know when you discovered making wine, was there like a magic moment when it ticked and you said, "I want to do this"? Was there like a time when it just became magical, or was it from that like from the start, or was it like a progression? Oh, when I first studied, started studying um, winemaking, you know, I didn't even know of all the different cultivars. And then as you go into first practically making the wines, you learn the chemistry and how everything works with everything. And then also how you can manipulate it, but where it is okay to do it and not to do it. So yes, there is this magical moment, but then it's not a moment where it clicked, I think, with every ferment that I start, um, there's this moment when it comes together. So and you, then, fall, you fall in love with the process? Yes, and then afterwards uh, you get to share it with your friends and family um, and then thinking back on how everything came to, back together and you think, you know, all those long evenings, all that hard work, it was everything was just worth it. And now you can taste it and share it? Now you can taste it and share it. So that is what they call a uh, uh, being fulfilled about what you do, because mm. that's a big thing. I think that's a lot, also a lot of cause for depression. It's like people do what they that what is expected for them to pay the bills, which is fair because you need to pay the bills. But uh, in the end, we all want meaning. But we'll get back to that. Let's we'll stick with the wine now. Okay, so and then I want to get to the alchemical process. It's not a perfect science, so there's variables. There's a lot of variables. So there's a bit of a, a gray area alchemical process. Do you have any views on the process of making wine? With the chemical process, there's this quote, I can't remember it now, it says basically you you have to be an astrophysicist using unreliable data you get from people who don't know what's going on. <laughs> so when I pick the grapes, um, we sample through the vineyards um, and it gives you an estimate on how the grapes are going to be here when you pick them. Then you they come to the cellar, it happens 5% of the time that the sugar is actually that that volume. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's the thing with chemistry is you can take it where you get it and work from the, there's not a specific point A or a specific point B. You just have to analyze it where you get it now and work with it from there on. So there's a bit of magic in the thing mm. going there. Which I like, and I figure, which is also poetic. Yeah, yeah, and to know one year is the same. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's so many things that there are, but I don't know. I'm thinking through my eyes. The, now. the water, the heat, the temperatures. Like we had this thunderstorms um, end of last year, and that lifted our sugar, our pH, our acids on us so low that um, compared to other years. So there's always these variables that you have to work with and the acids have an influence on how much colour is extracted and the health, general health of the wine, so you have to adjust that and you know, luckily we are allowed to adjust the acidity in South Africa. And uh, where can't you do it? It's like in Europe, so in Europe where the temperatures are colder, they are allowed to add sugar to the wine. Okay. Um, because they don't often get to that ripeness levels. We have heat so we naturally get the ripeness levels, but then because we're also hot, we're very hot, <laughs> we get to add um, acid to the wines. Okay. Uh, then uh, tell me about you. You are a winemaker, but you are a good winemaker. You've won some awards and stuff. Are you still very young? How old are you now? I'm turning 32 in July. Okay, it's full of spring chicken. Yeah. And you already have won awards. Tell me, tell me about the awards. Like for this year's Plateau Edition, we've won um, the for the Hush Levelates category for White Wine of the Year. And that's probably the one that stands out. And then, personally for me, it goes back to having made like Chenin Blanc Top 10 wines and, and stuff like that. But you know, wine is not for me about the awards because it's, it's very subjective. If you enter wine into a certain competition, you might win the, win the prize. But entering into the next competition is not necessarily going to have the same um, reaction. So, you know, for me, it's better to see what people think about the wine and I physically interact with them. So, what else can we talk about the wine? Is there anything like important that, that you feel like wine comes with poetry? What is 
but we're doing this. Well, the two it. definitely have a synergistic um, relationship. I think being a poet it helps you to think a bit more um, out of the box when it comes to making wines. Um, I certainly have a few strange techniques that I um, that I apply. And then also, when drinking wine, it helps me write the poetry, you know, so yes. it works together. And then, of course, I make some brandy and gin also. Okay, so is that a recent progression? Yeah. And uh, what's next after the brandy and the gin? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the other thing is just like, Wine and alcohol has always been with writers, right? It's like mm -hmm. right from the start, it's always been a thing. Greek, from the Greek philosophers that got drunk and writers that were alcoholics everywhere that did poetry and novels, it seems to like the, the spirit of the alcohol goes with the creative writing process. It seems like it's always been like that. It's interesting. Okay, but now let's get to, I, when I grew up, I also grew up with people around me that struggled with mental health and um, there was a, it was kind of hidden way back, it's like you know, they talk about it in the community and but people have always struggled with mental health and we all do to a certain degree so we can get to the mental health part now and uh, our people and we're in a much more open society now so people recognize it which is cool and which is important so tell me about your mental health struggles first of all uh, define your struggles for me, and then mm -hmm. where did it first start? How did it start? Well, I think my mental health struggles already presented when I was in school. Um, I started self harm, but it was really never um, put a name to it. Um, always just a teenager, you're moody, you're you know, going through hormone changes, and then when I was in university, my second, third year, it really started manifesting. Um, I went through great spells of depression, and to such an extent where my parents wanted me to stop studying for a year, and then just take a break and try again. And I said, no, you can't do this to me. This is literally the only thing I'm going for me right now is that I'm still able to study. So yeah, and then I was, um, um, they told me I had bipolar, so you go to the psychiatrist and you say, so do you drink? Yes, I drink, I'm a winemaker, you know, so. Um, yeah, so, so what age was this, so, say again? Uh, uh, 21. So it was actually quite late that you were actually I was diagnosed very late, yeah. But um, what happened was because I, just presented itself as suppression the entire time. They then put me on antidepressant and it triggered these manic phases. Um, and after that, um, my. I'm going to run back a bit. Yeah. When you were first diagnosed, was it like a relief? So, like, okay, now it explains stuff in my life? Was it a bit of a less pressure? Yes and no. Because, firstly, yeah, thanks. Now, everyone knows I'm not crazy. I've been telling you I'm not crazy. Now, I've, someone's validated this. But the second part is now you have a label. Yes. Now you have the label. And it, it took years for me um, to sort of get over that, specifically having to live now with this label. Because people, well, that was 10 years, 10, bit more than 10 years ago, they still do treat you differently and then uh, that's why for years I wouldn't talk to people about it and um, only a few of my closest friends knew um, but now um, I think it's only, only yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say once again we, all, we have all kinds of background noises here we're sitting in the cellar there's a working environment so I'm going to do my best with the sound and post but it is going to be what it's going to be so let's get back to the, the manic phases because from my experience um, especially if you're not on medication uh, from the people around me, it's like it can become extremely volatile, those manic phases. phases. It can become illogical, volatile, mm -hmm. and it is, can be, some, sometimes be quite shocking to the people around you. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that progression. Well, luckily for me, I never went on huge spending sprees or being like involved in super risky behavior, as they say. But um, 
Yeah, for, I just I I went suicidal. I my cell phone escalated. I didn't sleep. I just you know I was I was on a roll and I was uncontrollable. People I was scaring people around me. There's people outside you don't they don't see it. From your point of view, this is your world the other day. It's a foreign world to them, so it's, it can be scary uh, to people. And then you have to kind of you have to kind of ed educate. People need to be educated, like to to understand this and to to deal with it, because this is also part of humanity in our society. And um, must their process deal with your family, your friends. How do you mean that? It's like when you got diagnosed from the medic. That, that, but I'm, I'm assuming in the beginning there was probably a lot of uh, uh, frustration, fric friction and frustration. Yeah. Um, well, luckily um, my family is really intelligent. My dad is married to a psychologist and my mom, she's always on her phone googling stuff. So, so they really went to travel to, um, you know, like familiarize themselves with what is going on. Because they wanted to support me best they can. And um, they also had me put into a hospital three times now, and they saw I'm derailing now. Yeah. So, yeah. so they give you the, the understanding, and the, you know, it's, it, sometimes it's not going well, and there's, there's acceptance of it, and then you mm -hmm. manage the situation. And um, how did it affect your like, rom do you have romantic personal relationship? Did it... That that affected. Yeah. Well, I think it will affect every single relationship in your life. Mm. But you've totally accepted it now, and you, 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 this is part of your life, and you manage it. Okay. Yes, okay. I can. And uh, so, let's talk about you now, and especially on the winemaking and with your, with your psychology. Just give us a bit of an overview of how, how it is now. Okay, so I think I'm pretty stable on the re regime of medication that I'm on now, and I have an amazing therapist. And then, um, also, you know, with harvest, you sleep a lot less. And for me, well, sleep is sort of important. So it, it gets to you sometimes. Um, and you start dipping. But, um, you know, I'm like, I, I, I'm employed by people who also know my diagnosis and support me through that and will do everything in their power to, to make my environment. That's as, correct. Yeah, because you can see my office is in here, they've moved me away from all the noises and everything that can possibly trigger me and they keep me well fed. <laughs> and so, yeah. That's a very important thing about employers. Um, I think it's like uh, that understanding and understanding that people that are a bit different and weird and have mental issues also need to make a living and also need to live in a world. And needs to be accepted and be part of society. So I'm so proud that, and I hope some employers see this, mm -hmm. that if you have somebody, it's like people that used to be, it's a totally different thing, but people that used to be in prison for like faith, and they come out and nobody wants to employ them. But they're actually for good people, and they change their lives, and they just want to really good, there must be a, a space created for people that are different, um, to also work and be employed and live normal lives. And I think normal society has this responsibility because we're all part of the same society. I mean, I'm really good at my job. Um, my, my wine show the result thereof. So um, it's nice to have people giving you a safe space to do your work in. So, uh, and there's another thing that I see a lot, um, the medication. I think it's really important. At one stage, there were, were these like uh, hippie dippy people that said, "No man, just eat healthy and go off your medication, and you'll be fine." But I, I've seen how much damage that does because some people need to be chemi chemically corrected, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a physical thing. Yeah. And my my people, and I also know, they went off their medication for a while because they listened to people that don't know what they're talking about, and they completely went off the rails, and it actually it was. It was trauma to the whole family. Mm. So medication is important, getting the right medication and staying in the medication. Yeah, and with both the medication can also be like very frustrating to to, to be nice to drink it because um, it makes you feel kind of shit. Um, with the weight, you have weight gain, you have all these side effects, but you know, it's important to then rather manage that and have a stable, stable brain um, because 
without that in Hilton Ugly. Yeah. So I think this is a nice little interview about this thing. Uh, we talked about the wine and you read a poem. And I think there's a bit of better, better understanding, hopefully, about mental issues. So what I wanted to leave with the, my message last that I'm going to say, and then you can have the last say because it's about you, not about me. Um, I think uh, we need to accept all kinds of people in the world because we all have to, we're all born into this thing and now we have to make it work. So more acceptance of people that are different, that have certain types of issues. I think it, it will just make for a better, healthier world. What is your last thing that you would like to say? Be different. Be different. Short and sweet. Be different. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will. I was saying I've got a chair set. Oh, it's just <laughs> off camera <Hi>. chairs. <laughs> yes. Okay, guys, please. Uh, uh, I I love what I'm doing. This thing, and I think it's a good thing. I hope so. Please subscribe to the channel that helps you. Don't only watch, subscribe if you can. Okay, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Bye.